Welcome to Bench to Bedside, a weekly series of live conversations about recent advances in cancer, from the research bench to treatment at the patient's bedside. And now, your host and the director of the University of Kansas Cancer Center, Dr. Roy Jensen. Good morning. I'm Dr. Roy Jensen, director of the University of Kansas Cancer Center. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of Bench to Bedside. With me today is Annie Seal, Children's uh, Program Director at Turning Point, and Laura Fries, joining us by Skype. Laura is a pivot member and was a caregiver to her husband, Carl, who was diagnosed with squamous cell carcinoma in August 2011. Laura, I want to start uh, with you. Um, would you please um, uh, begin by telling us about your husband's cancer diagnosis? Certainly. Um, he was diagnosed in August of 2011 with squamous cell carcinoma on his tongue on the left side. And he had a few episodes prior to this as a young, really young man with plaque areas once was lasered off and then things kind of kept recurring there. So he was finally diagnosed uh, nine years ago and surgery was scheduled for about six weeks later. And my sons were eight and almost 14 at the time. So talking to them about their dad's diagnosis was of course a big, a big deal in our family. So he had surgery at KU Med and um, was in the hospital for a week, pretty radical um, removal of all the lymph nodes on that side of his neck and the tongue excision and floor of the mouth. And then um, that was, it was stage zero to one. So he was supposed to be finished and then had a recurrence about six months later, in February of 2012, had um, another cancerous lesion in the same area. So we had a second surgery, and then they followed up with radiation just to be a little bit more sure that it wasn't going to recur. And he has been cancer-free since 2012. That's that's fantastic. Um, and, and thanks for that uh, background, because obviously that's kind of critical to today's uh, episode. Um, could you Tell us um, kind of what your approach was in terms of um, talking to your children uh, about your husband's diagnosis and what was your approach in terms of, of keeping them, um, you know, updated in, in terms of how things were um, uh, progressing. Sure. We, um, we talked to each other ahead of time and then we sat both of the boys down together and told them their dad had cancer in uh, the tongue and we went so far as to explain the type of cancer and kind of what what treatment options were and assured them that you know the doctors were going to do everything they possibly could and that we would be really aggressive but that things were going to be kind of hard uh, with their schedules and things like that while dad was in the hospital we're a very scientific family. My husband's a veterinarian and I'm a science teacher and we have a lot of experiments going on all the time at our house. And so they really appreciated getting the medical terminology and the facts. Um, and we, every time we went to the doctor, we'd kind of come home and tell the kids what the, what the physicians had said. And, um, so they felt pretty confident. I think we were upbeat enough that they felt like their dad was going to be fine. Um, one of the things that our older son said, I talked to him a couple of weeks ago about this process, kind of asked him to think back and, and what his experience was like. He's 20, he'll be 23 next week. Um, he thought it might've been nice if we had let uh, the boys ask questions of the doctors through us, like write down questions that the boys had, and then we could go ask the doctors and then report back to the boys. Um so apparently we didn't do as good a job of answering all their questions as, as we like to think we did. Um, they both went with Carl to a radiation treatment at KU and they enjoyed seeing that experience and meeting the team and thought, you know, as we all did, that everybody at KU was super caring and competent and that was the best place for Carl to be. Um, so we, we approached it from a very proactive standpoint and explained a lot of things and, um, one of the things, another thing my son said, he wished we had explained a little bit more about what the surgery was going to be like. I think kids have that image of cancer patients from television, like chemotherapy and maybe losing your hair and being sick. And Carl didn't have chemotherapy. The surgery was the primary treatment for him. And that was maybe a little bit less familiar to the boys. I see. 
So, uh, Laura, you're a member of, of Pivot, but probably have maybe a little bit of a different background than what, say, many of our uh, Pivot members have. Uh, could you tell us, you know, kind of what got you into Pivot and, and about your experience since uh, you've, you've been a member? Sure. Um, Carl was invited to join Pivot as a, as a patient, obviously, and a, a panel discussion on long-term survivorship um, after cancer. Um, and then I was invited to join that conversation as a caregiver as um, what questions we had long after the diagnosis and surgery and treatment were over. And that was really eye-opening for me to see it from more patient standpoint, because I only had my own experience with Carl, um, and to get to provide some of those questions as the caregiver too. Um, we, I participated in the spring. We had Pivot had weekly Zoom meetings for anybody to just kind of check in and talk about how we were dealing with the pandemic and how that was affecting patients that are in treatment. So that was really also educational for me. Um, and then Carl and I are both currently working with Dr. Kevin Sykes on a grant proposal that he's written um, to add more resources for oral cancer survivors and their families. Um, so we've been screening some websites and some resources and, and giving him feedback on his grant proposal. Uh, we were supposed to go to a symposium in Chicago this summer on, on that, and of course that got canceled. So being part of Pivot is really important to Carl um, as the, the person kind of on the other side, the long-term survivorship with cancer. He really, really wants to be able to give back to not only to KU for taking care of him, but to other other patients who are just in the thick of things right now. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that experience uh, with us. I, I, I believe it's, it's a fantastic example of how when a, when a patient's diagnosed with cancer, it, it really involves, um, you know, their entire circle of, of their family, their friends, and, and everybody, and, and why it's important to take into consideration um, you know, that whole um, uh, circle of, of folks. Um, so now I want to turn uh, to Annie. Why, um, uh, may, maybe just to begin, why, why is it so important to talk with children um, when um, a loved one in their family uh, has just been diagnosed with cancer? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, as Laura mentioned, it does affect the whole family. And um, they did such a great job of really thinking about how their kids process information and what makes sense for their family. And they were a science-based family, so they approached it from that standpoint. Um, and kids really do look to their parents on how to respond to situations, especially unfamiliar situations. So sometimes our kids look to us um, to know how to navigate a new situation. And so when there is a new diagnosis, such as cancer, as she mentioned, kids only know what they've seen maybe in the media or maybe what someone else experienced. And so we really want to give them the story based on what is true for our family mm -hmm. and what information do we want them to have. And that's why it's so important to share the information that we have been told from our physicians and what is the story that is true for our family. Because as we know, every diagnosis is different, treatment is different, and um, we really want to share that information with our kids in a way that makes sense for our family. So when our kids ask us those really hard questions, sometimes they're questions that don't have clear-cut answers. And so I always like to think of it that sometimes our kids are asking us questions, sometimes just to see how do we respond. And sometimes they're asking us those hard questions to see are we okay hearing the answer. You know, are we okay with them asking those questions? And um, they're looking to see what is our response. So does my kid ask me a question and I like, you know, it's one of those questions that makes my stomach drop and I think, oh my gosh, how do I answer this? And that, and that's okay to, you know, for them to ask me those hard questions. Um, and it's okay for me to not know the answer and to say, you know, I don't know the answer to that question right now. But let's talk about this as a family, and let's ask our doctor this question. Um, and as she said, maybe allow your kids an opportunity to ask you know, questions that they have for the doctor. Mm -hmm. um, just to really keep that conversation going and have that conversation open so that they don't hear things from someone else. You want them to get that information from you. And when they ask you a question that maybe you don't have an answer to, 
right, immediately you can say, you know, what makes you wonder about that right now? And then you can sometimes get to the bottom of why are they asking that? And they might say, well, someone at school said this about you, or I overheard you say this on the phone. And then you can sometimes get to the bottom of why they're asking that question, and that can sometimes make you feel a little bit more confident in your answer mm -hmm. and how to respond. And so it just kind of keeps that um, keeps that conversation open throughout the whole um, treatment. Mm -hmm. So if you're just joining us, we're here with Annie Seal from Turning Point and Laura Fries, a caregiver and pivot member. Remember to share this link with people who may benefit uh, from our discussion. Use the hashtag bench to bedside. So um, Annie, what types of programs does Turning Point have uh, specifically uh, for children? Um, with uh, a loved one who has uh, um, either been diagnosed with cancer or has some other form of chronic illness? Yeah, all of our programs um, are geared or are based in a model of resilience. Um, our programs help build resilience in children and families affected by illness. They also promote positive coping skills and answer some of those questions that kids have surrounding illness. So like she mentioned, um, sometimes kids wanna know more about a particular surgery or procedure, or they want to know a little bit more about a treatment. And so we can um, kind of help navigate some of those questions. Um, all of our programs are chosen to be developmentally appropriate, so they're based on a child's developmental stage. We um, use a lot of expressive arts and different modalities to help kids kind of navigate through that process. Um, our programs currently are being all offered virtually um, just because of what's going mm -hmm. on in mm -hmm. our world right now. Right. So as I mentioned, the expressive arts. So our programs range everything from um, art to music to body movement. So that might look something like um, body movement might be family yoga or we have, for instance, we've been doing an online um, virtual therapeutic story time where um, there's an art component and we read a book that might be related to feelings or coping and then we have um, an interactive art project that kids do in their home mm -hmm. with one of our facilitators. Um, we might also do, provide some um, play-based programs that would be maybe medical play where kids are able to um, kind of give clarify misconceptions that they might have about medical procedures or um, concerns that they have. And we do all of that through um, play and art. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a, a, a bit of a curveball uh, at you here. Okay. Um, how do your programs um, assess kind of the um, uh, cultural sensitivity issues around um, – you know this this problem because different cultures have different approaches uh, when talking about death or serious mm -hmm. illness and and um, what is your process for making that assessment and making sure that um, you know you're designing a program that's going to fit the circumstances of, of that particular family you know um, we always look to the parents to the be the expert in their child and in their family so we do have um, group programs, but if we were working with a family individually, we would definitely, um, well, our group programs, we would let parents know ahead of time, like what's gonna be involved in that group and let them ask those questions and see if that's something that they assess would be appropriate for mm -hmm. their family. Um, obviously, individually, we would um, make sure that what we were covering was something that the family was comfortable with. Um, and as you spoke of culturally, um, different people's feelings on death or how you explain things, um, we really look to the parents to be, to be the guide of that because ultimately um, they are going to be the ones that are answering those long-term questions. Mm -hmm. And so we really, our goal is to really guide parents um, on how do you facilitate those conversations. And we actually have a class coming up um, on October 8th called Answering Hard Questions That Kids Ask. Um, another service we offer is parent consultation. So parents can call in 
Um, it can be done via phone or email, and they can just call and say, hey, you know, I was just diagnosed with breast cancer. I have an eight-year-old. This is what's going on in our family. Can you kind of help us navigate that? So that's mm -hmm. another, another service that we offer that can be done kind of individually based. Mm -hmm. So um, just to kind of sum things up, what, what would you say are the kind of the key takeaways that would help summarize the programs that are offered, you know, for children where someone in the family member uh, is dealing with a serious illness? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, all of our programs are offered without charge um, to anyone affected by serious or chronic illness, patients and their supporters and children. Um, and we're just really here as a resource to help people navigate this journey of illness. There's never a good or bad time to call or reach out to us. Um, you know, people say, oh, I didn't call at the beginning of illness. Is it too late? Um, or I should have called earlier. Is it too late? Mm -hmm. um, and there's never, there's never a good or bad time to call. Whenever you are comfortable making that connection is the right time for your family. So we mm -hmm. don't want people to to not make the connection because they feel like they missed that opportunity. Um, and anyone who's interested in participating in programs can, um, they can call to get more information at 913-574-0900. Um, they can also, um, we have a community calendar that's printed every two months where you can find all of our classes that are offered. And um, that can be found on the health system website at kansashealthsystem.com slash turning point. And to register for programs, we're currently doing all online registration um, in addition to that phone call. And that is through A Barry, and that's B A R R Y 3 at K U M C dot E D U. So people can, there's really a multiple ways to reach out. And when in doubt, really just call or email. And um, we can get you connected with adult program director, Lizzie, or myself, if you're looking for programs for children and families. That's great. Um, Laura, I, I, you know, I can't thank you enough for sharing uh, your uh, experience. And um, certainly before we go, I want to make sure that, um, you know, we hear your advice um, for families that are dealing uh, with a loved one's uh, cancer diagnosis. What what would you say is, is critical from, from your standpoint? I, I wish that my kids had used the turning point um, resources maybe when we were going through this. Um, I'd say my advice is to talk to the kids separately, which just because if they have questions that are, my boys were pretty far apart at eight and 14 and their concerns were different and their language was different. So it might've been a good idea to talk to them um, separately, and that was some advice I got from the American Cancer Society website. Um, discussing the long-term um, treatment and survivorship, because you know, six weeks of therapy to us doesn't seem like very long, but to a child, it might that's hard for them to gauge time and like, how long will Dad not be himself? How long is eating going to be an issue? How long until he's back to work and things like that? So time, I think you need to keep having those conversations. Um, and involve them as much as you can on an age appropriate level, whether it's a hospital visit so that they're reassured that mystery things aren't happening in the hospital, which I know we can't do now during the COVID epidemic, but um, that was nice for my boys to be able to come to the hospital and, and see dad um, or helping out at home, you know, fill up a water bottle or um, take some medication upstairs if it's time and, and things like that, I think was, uh, were, were helpful and just involving family and friends and teachers so that there are a lot of eyes on the kids and, and people who can support them um, in different settings. That's great advice. So if you don't mind saying, what what are your boys up to now? Oh, that's nice of you to ask. One of them is a senior in high school this year, and he's going to school in person part of the day and online part of the day. Um, and then my older son is finishing up his chemical engineering degree at MU and he works full time at the nuclear reactor um, on the Mizzou campus. And he works actually with um, the radio pharmaceuticals that they make there. Oh, his yeah. lab does quality control for all the radioactive treatments that go into human medicine. And so that's been kind of nice for him to be able to serve the cancer community a little bit um, as a son of a survivor. Yep. So that's what they're. That's fantastic. Well, thank you uh, so much. 
Uh, that's it uh, for today. To learn more, please visit kansashealthsystem.com forward slash turning point. Thanks for watching.